issue 111 appears to be a team up with the guy with the worst ever mask, Devil Slayer. It also seems to feature none other than Uncle Ben. In reality, it's more of a team up between Spidey and the Defenders, which in itself leads on to what must be, well, I wanna say it's the least likely team up ever, aside from these silly issues. But you may say, what about the time when Spidey teamed up with Frankenstein's monster or Red Sonja? Which I would say was a very good point. But those adventures took place in Spidey's world in the modern day with Red Sonja kind of possessing Mary Jane. In this issue, Spider-Man, or rather his astral form, actually travels back in time to Volusia to team up with Cull and his supporting cast. And it is rather jarring seeing him rub shoulders with the likes of Brawl and the Red Slayers. Whilst we're on the subject, can I just point out what an underrated series Cull the Conqueror slash Cull the Destroyer was? It only lasted 29 issues, but I don't think there was a weak one amongst them. I'd love to do a series focusing on Cull someday. But for now, we wave goodbye to him and say hello to issue 113's guest star, Quasar. Quasar, real name Wendell Vaughan, had a bit of a wobbly first few years in the Marvel Universe. After debuting as Marvel Boy in issue 217 of Captain America, he quickly changed his name to Marvel Man and then Quasar, and popped up in various titles such as The Incredible Hulk and The Avengers. Unusually for a superhero, he managed to get himself a job as head of security at Project Pegasus, and it is in that role that he crosses paths with the wall crawler for the first time. Regular writer Jam Dematius, who had only started his new residency with issue 111, steps aside for this one, as Mark Grunewald, a man who nursed Quasar through the early years of his character development, takes up the writer's pen. It does still stick with the regular artist though, as Herb Trimpey keeps a firm grip on his pencil. It starts out as a normal day. Not a normal day for the likes of you and me, but a normal day for Peter Parker, because he's on his way to university, and he isn't late. However, things begin to go awry. Because as he passes an armored car, his spider sense is triggered. He lands on it to investigate, but as he does so, there's a flash of light and Quasar appears. Quasar is the security chief at Project Pegasus, and he is accompanying the armored car, which also belongs to Project Pegasus. And within that armored car, they are transporting securely the supervillain known as Nitro, who Spider-Man defeated back in issue 55 of Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man. He explains all this to Spider-Man and reassured, Spidey leaves him to it. Now this may not be a good thing because shortly after Spidey leaves, Quasar detects a disturbance in the uh, local electricity field and he sets out to investigate. He traces it to a local college campus. I don't have to tell you which college, do I? And it seems that the source of this disturbance is coming from beneath the ground. Conjuring up a spectacularly sized drill bit, Quasar drills under the ground where he finds a hidden laboratory. He still can't find uh, the exact source of the energy, but unfortunately for Quasar, the energy has found him. The energy, some kind of light, completely envelops his energy bands feeding off of their power. Soon it has enough energy to take form, a form of a person made of living light. That person has a name, it is Lightmaster. Now Lightmaster has crossed paths with Spider-Man before and of course was defeated by him. But in defeating him, Spidey created an electrical overload that converted uh, his human form into living light. Now Lightmaster wants his human form back and is going to use, going to possess Quasar in order to do that. We then cut to a biochemistry class where we hear the most sciencey uh, speech bubble ever. In regards to carbonyl absorption, the ring strain in cyclic compounds caused quite a large shift to higher frequency. I mean, does it actually make sense? Is it real science? I have no idea. And I'll never find out because this is interrupted by Peter Parker's spider sense. Taking care not to wake up the other students as he leaves, it's one quick change for Peter before he meets up with his old adversary. A fight then naturally ensues 
which includes Spider-Man making a web shield, which he throws at Lightmaster. Don't know what he thought that was going to achieve. Eventually, after Lightmaster has created some weapons out of solid light, Spider-Man discovers the truth. That Lightmaster has possessed the body of Quasar. Unable to overcome the combined power of Lightmaster and Quasar, Spidey beats a tactical retreat. As I said before, Lightmaster wants to be able to revert to his human form. His old lab, where he did plan to do this, uh, has been completely disassembled, so the equipment he needs is no longer there. So as an alternative, he breaks into a, an electrical wholesaler and steals uh, various components that he's gonna need uh, to build the machine that will revert him to human. And it's at that point that Quasar begins to resist his control. It seems that since Lightmaster first appeared, Quasar has been in a kind of zombie-like state. Now, regaining consciousness, he forces Lightmaster out of his bracelets. But it appears there's little he can do, because as Lightmaster says, how can you harm a being of pure energy? Any uh, energy bolts that he fires at Lightmaster just feed him. And before long, Quasar finds those bolts being fired back in his direction. And he is soon, once again, unconscious, prompting an actual evil laugh from Lightmaster. Later that night, it's no difficult task for Spider-Man to track down Lightmaster, thanks to the uh, bright glow that he gives off. And after bursting into his lair, he destroys the machine that he was working on. Not really sure why though. He's now condemning Lightmaster uh, to a life without human form. Maybe I'm too soft. Lightmaster creates duplicates of himself and whilst Spider-Man struggles to battle those, Quasar regains consciousness. He reasons that if Lightmaster is feeding off of the energy from his power bands, then if he switches those power bands off, it will deprive Lightmaster of that energy source. The effect is instantaneous as his clones vanish and without Quasar's power uh, to hold his cells together, Lightmaster himself dissipates. Our two heroes then try to work out what it was that Lightmaster was doing. Spider-Man explains that he saw uh, Lightmaster rigging up that machinery to his old suit, Lightmaster's old suit. And he remarks, I don't think he was dry cleaning it. No Spidey, he was trying to live again. Quasar's worked it out. And he says that if Spider-Man can help him determine uh, Edward Lansky, that's Lightmaster's, precise wavelength, he thinks he may be able to help him. If you say so. Calculations are made and then Quasar hits Lightmaster's suit with a huge bolt of energy. The costume swells, Lightmaster is reformed and Edward Lansky has regained his humanity. I never liked Lightmaster's suit with that silly little tiny face thing it had. Anyway, Spider-Man's still on form because he randomly decks Lightmaster. Quasar's all, what'd you do that for? And Spidey says his spider sense warned him that Lightmaster was about to zap Quasar. But Quasar points out that now that Lightmaster is corporeal, his light suit wouldn't have been a match for his wristbands. So decking him was totally unnecessary. Spidey doesn't take the criticism too well. And in a huff, he decides to just leave Quasar to deal with Lightmaster's unconscious body himself, which is a bit weird. He says, I'll leave Lightmaster in your hind mighty hands. Bye. They're always in a bad mood today. Anyway, Quasar does deal with Lightmaster's unconscious body and Spider-Man swings off muttering to himself like Yosemite Sam. Issue 114 sees Spider-Man team up with the Falcon to weed out the criminals that have infiltrated a group of young vigilantes called the Young Watchers. They were clearly based on real-life vigilante group, the Guardian Angels, who had begun operating in New York just a couple of years beforehand. And if you aren't convinced, just compare the Young Watchers' uniform headwear of red cowboy hats to the Guardian Angels' red berets. Spider-Man and Thor go up against an unearthly couple of beings in issue 115, whose threat endures to the next issue when they possess Valkyrie via her sword. And I have to say, this is a very entertaining issue with Jam Dematius on fine form. That brings us on to issue 117, which features the very first time that Wolverine was a title character, as it predates his limited series by four months. And who do you think wrote it? 
No, it wasn't Chris Claremont, it was regular writer Jeremy Dematius. And he is alongside regular artist Herb Trimpey, who, of course, has history with the character, being the first artist to draw him back in issues 180 and 181 of The Incredible Hulk. Wolverine is tracking a beautifully rendered stag. Stags always look good, don't they? The stag is completely unaware of Wolverine's presence, but equally, Wolverine is completely unaware that he is being surveilled by some unseen observer. We quickly learn that Wolverine isn't actually hunting the stag, he's just honing his tracking powers. And so this exercise ends with him tapping the deer lightly on the rump. Those self-same tracking abilities alert him to the presence of somebody else nearby, somebody on horseback. The scent he has picked up belongs to some kind of guard dressed as a Roman centurion. Classic uh, old school lackey, dress them as Romans. This guard tells Wolverine that he is committing a crime by trespassing on the master's property. And the guard isn't alone. There are dozens more Romans, all there uh, to take Wolverine in for that heinous crime. The guard says to him, will you come quietly? And Wolverine says, sure, I'm always as quiet as a mouse. When I'm busting heads. Ha, fooled you, stupid centurion. We are told there are over 100 of the master's finest warriors, all being held off by just one man. There's only one thing left to do, gas him. The gas has the desired effect, and whoever the master is, we now discover that he is a professor. The professor explains that due to recent run-ins with Captain America and the Defenders, uh, in which of course uh, he came out uh, the worst, he feels he has to study superheroes, to understand how they think, how they feel, how they operate. And to do that, he's gonna compare and contrast two uh, different subjects. Now he has one. The next one is already in his crosshairs. Another fine day in New York City. And Spider-Man is in high spirits. They quickly get dampened, however, when he is approached by, wait for it, a Roman centurion in a mini personal jet. He is there with orders to take in Spider-Man, forcibly if need be. And of course, again, he isn't alone, as this time he is backed up by a fleet of Romans uh, in their own mini personal jets. I mean, that's gotta be a compliment, hasn't it? Having a whole little fleet sent after you? Anyway, Spider-Man struggles to overcome all of the jets. He takes a few out, but then decides that discretion is the better part of valor and he hides behind a building. The Jets struggle to find him, to such an extent that they leave. That's different. What isn't different is that he had time to place a spider tracer uh, on one of the Jets before they left. Anyway, enough about Spider-Man. What's Wolverine been up to? He has regained consciousness to find himself in an arena. Superhero comics do love arenas, don't they? He's facing off against what appears to be a medieval knight. He manages to unseat and unmask the knight to discover that underneath uh, the helmet is an old man. Nonetheless, Wolverine doesn't hold back and he takes him out with one big swipe of his claws. Whoa, Wolvie, he's an old man. What do you think he, oh, he's a robot. Well, that makes sense. Wolverine then tears himself an exit and discovers something unexpected. Meanwhile, Spider-Man has followed the spider tracer and has discovered a castle that arises from the woodland floor. He takes the classic approach of, it's probably a trap, so let's spring the trap. And oh my word, traps are plenty there are. And eventually he succumbs to a fake floor that was hiding a deep pit. But he conjures up a web cushion to break his fall. So what was it that Wolverine discovered? Well, it was some kind of bacchanalian feast. There were people there uh, still dressed uh, in, in a Roman theme, men and women uh, enjoying food and drink. And some women approach Wolverine and say, we are here to serve you in every way. Come, join us in the pleasures of the flesh. But Wolverine isn't fooled. He says, no way, you're just robots. Oh, slow down, Wolvie. No rush, no rush. After slicing and dicing those robots, look who's joined the party. 
Initially, Wolverine assumes he's just another robot and launches himself at Spidey. A misunderstanding in a Marvel team-up comic? Surely not. Spidey quickly puts Wolverine's fears at ease and explains to him what he thinks is going on. He says, it seems like we're being tested, the limits of our power being gauged. Interesting theory, I have no idea what he's basing it on. Surely it's more likely that whoever's behind this is just trying to kill them. Anyway, uh, the mystery doesn't remain much longer because soon a giant robot arrives to explain his master's plan. The master wants to observe how our heroes deal with a conundrum that he's about to place before them. Several miles to the south of the castle is a prison and that prison is due in the next uh, 12 minutes to be gassed by one of the master's planes. Everyone within the prison will die. A few miles to the north of the castle is a small town called Ivy. A number of the master's troops are marching uh, on Ivy and they are going to assault the town and again kill every living person within it. Finally, there's a detailed map uh, of the castle showing the location of the master. The explanation ends with Wolverine leaping up and destroying the head of the robot. I don't know how he got that high without Colossus throwing him. So there you have it, three options but just two heroes. If they want to save everyone's lives, then the master will escape. If they don't want the master to escape, then they're going to have to choose uh, who dies. It's a nice little moral dilemma. Not much of a dilemma for Wolverine though. He thinks the choice is clear. Spider-Man should uh, deal with the army that are marching on Ivy and he will stay there and deal with the master. He'll shed no tears for the prisoners. They are, as he describes them, the lowest of the low. They deserve whatever's coming their way. But Spider-Man, of course, says, who are they to decide who lives and who dies? Time is pressing and they have to make a decision. But Spidey says he isn't happy with Wolverine's. So he ups and swings out of the castle. Wolverine says, are you going to the town? And Spidey says, no, I'm going to the prison. Knowing full well that no matter how much Wolverine wanted the master, there's no way he would let the innocent people of the town be killed. Nice little bit of uh, mental outmaneuvering by Spidey. He has no trouble dealing with the plane headed towards the prison and Wolverine is about to have a whole world of fun with the army marching on the town when they suddenly decide to teleport away. And that is when he discovers that the town was completely abandoned anyway. Wolverine doesn't like being set up but by the time that he and Spider-Man get back to the location of the castle, the castle itself is gone. They discover uh, an underground tunnel down which the castle must have uh, trundled away and surely it's a lot larger than it looks uh, on the page. But before they have time uh, to head after it, the tunnel collapses. And then our main villain is unveiled. He's giving some kind of lecture uh, to his Roman troops and he's named as Professor Power. And he finishes by saying, class is dismissed for now. And believe it or not, the tale ends there, which is odd, because it feels like it really should be a two-parter. That's because it is, but Wolverine's role in it is pretty much over, as his own professor takes the spotlight. The creative team doesn't change though, as Messrs. Dematius and Trimpey are still at the helm. Initially, it looks like we are in for more of the same kind of antics as the last issue, but we are actually in the danger room. After dodging the usual kind of danger room tests and completing the exercise, Spider-Man says for Schlugginer for the second issue in a row. Is it a common word in America? I've only ever heard it, well, seen it, uh, in Marvel Comics. For Schlugginer. What does it even mean? What, what, where does it originate from? Professor X appears, smoking a pipe. Ah, the age of pipe-smoking superheroes. He points out that it's obvious that Spider-Man didn't want to take part in the Danger Room exercise and that Wolverine uh, should have been more sensitive to this. He says he clearly has much to learn in the field of interpersonal relations. To which Wolverine responds, Call it Charlie, nobody talks to me like that, understand? Nobody! And he pops his claws with the customary uh, uh, thwicked sound. A little bit sensitive from Wolverine.
It's not like Professor X called him a Spider-Man quickly diffuses the tension and they all go off for a bite to eat. We only see a couple of the other X-Men, but one of them is old school Kitty Pride in her Sprite persona. We also learn that Professor X has been invited to a meeting with Professor Anthony Power, a noted historian and expert on foreign affairs. Professor Power sends a car to collect a Professor X and Spidey, never being one to miss an opportunity, decides to hitch a ride back to town by sticking himself uh, to the car's roof. During the trip, Spidey's spider sense is triggered, but he can't work out uh, where the danger is. And although Professor X feels unsettled in the car, a quick scan of the driver's mind doesn't reveal uh, anything uh, of concern. Once at Professor Power's uh, mansion, Professor X scans his mind and again, uh, there is nothing of concern there. And then Professor Power explains his own philosophy. He says that the only way to move against the enemies of democracy, to annihilate all the threats to freedom in the world, is to control the world. He says we must learn the lessons uh, of Rome, of Alexander the Great. One mind, one power must control this tormented earth. He says there doesn't have to be any bloodshed. A powerful telepath such as uh, Professor X can join with other similarly powered people uh, to cleanly uh, wipe uh, people's minds of, of, of any uh, negative thoughts, of any uh, intention to not toe the line. Professor X is shocked to hear that Professor Power knows about his powers. He also knows about the X-Men. But nonetheless, that isn't why he called Professor X there. He called him there for another purpose. Meanwhile, Spider-Man couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong uh, with, with the driver, and he followed the car to the mansion, and now he's inside the mansion, he has stumbled across the guards, who, of course, look very familiar. Whilst Spider-Man cracks on fighting the guards, Professor Power uh, is explaining why he has called the teacher of the X-Men to his mansion. Professor Power's son lies in a catatonic state his mind broken by the horrors of war that he witnessed whilst serving in Vietnam. Professor Power wants uh, Charles Xavier to mentally enter his son's mind and essentially uh, heal it. And indeed, Professor X does try to do this, but he says there is nothing he can do. His son's mental state is extremely precarious and any further probing could uh, throw out that delicate balance forever. But Professor Power doesn't believe him. He thinks he's lying and he just doesn't want to help his son. And so uh, he traps Professor X in a psychoplastic cage, basically a big bubble. He explains that he uh, and his henchmen have been wearing devices uh, designed by a colleague of his called Mr. Fix. And those devices uh, screen uh, the, the wearer's mind from any psychic probing. That is how he screened his real intentions from the professor and how the professor didn't pick up on anything suspicious uh, with the car driver. Professor Power's plan now is to transfer Professor X's power from him into Mentallo. Mentallo himself is in his own kind of catatonic state after his brain was essentially fried during a run-in with the Micronauts. Professor Power says, all that Mentello needs is a spark to revivify him. And that spark will be provided by Professor X. Then he will do what Professor X is refusing to do and heal the broken mind of the professor's son. But Professor Power also has another bigger goal in mind. With his son returned to full health, he will use Mentello to launch a mind war against the Soviet Union that will allow the United States to rise up unchallenged as masters of the world. Which is the plan that's already brought him into conflict with Captain America and the Defenders. Professor X then puts in uh, an extra strong effort to try to exert some psychic control over Professor Power to stop him from flicking the switch uh, on the machine that will drain him of his powers. As Power berates his friend Mr. Fix for not making the psychic uh, defense devices strong enough, Spider-Man makes his entrance. It is now revealed that Mr. Fix is actually the Fixer, a colleague of Mentallo's who we also uh, last saw in that issue of The Defenders. 
whilst Spider-Man and the Fixer fight in the physical world, Professor X and Mentallo fight in the psychic world. Professor X's abilities are far superior to those of Mentallo. However, this battle is taking place whilst the machine is slowly draining Professor X of his powers and adding them to Mentallo's. I have to say at this point that this two-handed battle works really well. The two heroes fighting uh, two villains kind of in the same space, definitely at the same time, but the battles are totally separate from each other. Of course, uh, they end up in the favour of the heroes. As with a final effort, Professor X conjures up a telepathic dagger, yes, I know, it looks more like an arrow, uh, to destroy Mentallo's kind of psychic bird form. And after the Fixer tries to gas Spider-Man, Spidey, no way. He conjures up the most ridiculous web item ever. As the Fixer says, he webbed up some kind of makeshift copter blades that actually work. That is ridiculous. I've seen a few weird web items in my time, but that takes the biscuit. I don't think I've ever used that phrase before. Anyway, the blades do their job and blow the gas away, giving Spidey the opportunity to knock out the fixer. As the battle draws to a close, there's a sudden scream from Professor Power's son. Professor X says there can only be one explanation. There are still remnants of his psychic energies in Professor Power's son's mind when Mentallo uh, attacked him. And the machine that was draining Professor X's power must also have drained those remnants that were in uh, his son's mind too. As a result, his son's uh, psyche was also kind of trapped in that battle between uh, Professor X and Mentallo, and it just couldn't take the strain. All hope of reaching him has been lost forever. At that point, police officers burst in, having received uh, reports of some kind of commotion uh, in the house. But Professor X uses his abilities to project a very different scene to them than the actual sad truth. Gosh, a rather poignant ending. And I assume that is the ending, and it doesn't extend into a third part? It kind of does, several issues later, in issue number 124, featuring The Beast. The cover says, Professor Power's back with a vengeance. And some of you may now be thinking, oh yeah, I know Professor Power, because this is his usual look. He didn't have it before, so what's changed? Well, one thing that has changed is the artist as by the time that this issue came out, Herb had moved on and the new regular penciler, Kerry Gamble, had taken over. J.M. is still the writer though, and this wouldn't be the last time that he wrote the character, as he would bring him back for a couple of storylines in The Spectacular Spider-Man and The New Defenders. Now, about that image change. The mobile castle from issue 117 is back, and within that castle, beyond our old friends, the Roman guards, is a high-tech laboratory, and within that laboratory, something incredible is happening. Two men are rigged up to a machine. One of them is Professor Power, recently released from prison, having pulled some political strings. The other, wearing uh, the more recognisable Professor Power outfit, is his son. His son's mind is still broken, but the professor is hoping that this machine will infuse his psyche into his son's body. The procedure is a success, which means that not only does Professor Power have his young son's body uh, to use, but his scientists have already been working on that body to augment it, hence uh, the suit that he's wearing. He now has an alpha converter uh, in his brain that makes him able to summon up the energy within him and achieve incredible feats. He wants revenge on Professor X for the suffering that his son has been through. And he's going to exact that revenge, uh, starting with the people that he sees as the Professor's own children, the X-Men, one of whom we're about to meet. Three days have passed, and at a busy Kennedy airport, an excited beast is waiting to meet his parents uh, from their flight. He's excited to see them, but also nervous because it'll be the first time that they've seen him in his new blue furry form, and he doesn't know how they're gonna react. For us, the reader, uh, this furry form first emerged about a decade before in issue 11 of Amazing Adventures, although initially he was gray. His dad is an upbeat kind of guy, and he's chuffed to see his son. 
His mother, on the other hand, not so much. Later that evening, Hank, his parents, and Hank's current squeeze, Vera, are having a meal in an Indian restaurant. Hank says he's noticed that his mother has been a bit off with him, and he reaches out to her, saying, please, tell me what's wrong. But as he does so, his mum reacts by shouting out, don't touch me, you disgusting freak. Hank's dad tries to make excuses for her, but she doubles down by saying, this creature isn't my son. Look at him, he's a disgrace, a horror. As she storms out of the restaurant, Hank's dad again tries to uh, make excuses for her and say that she doesn't mean to hurt Hank, but he has to understand the history here. When she was pregnant with Hank, both parents were concerned that uh, the baby may be born with a deformity because uh, Hank's dad was exposed to a lot of radiation uh, in his work. When that didn't happen, and they had uh, what seemed to be a perfectly normal baby, um, his mum then had plans for his future. He would have a great future, a great life. But when eventually Hank left to join the X-Men, those plans for a normal life uh, kind of died. Now that Hank is not only world famous, but blue and furry, uh, his life, how it's turned out, doesn't match up with the life that she dreamed uh, of him having, and she finds that difficult to reconcile. Incredibly, and to his credit, Hank understands and says he wants to go and speak to her. And his dad says, that's my boy, one of a kind, and I wouldn't have him any other way. So although it seems that uh, his two parents have totally opposing views about the same thing, they don't because his dad is looking at Hank, uh, the individual, the person. His mum is looking at the life that he's leading. Do you know, I can't help but feel that we've forgotten someone. Oh yeah, Professor Power. As Hank braces off after his mother, Professor Power announces his arrival in the most spectacular of ways. He says, you are Henry McCoy, a mutant freak known to the masses as the beast. Quite funnily, after what Hank's just been through in the restaurant, he takes great exception to being called a freak. But he quickly discovers that the professor is not someone to be trifled with. He says that his punch is worthy of the thing. At one point, the professor mentions studying the beast. Um, I don't know if that's an attempt to tie uh, this into his earlier motives from issue 117. Um, I think probably not because his motives have kind of flipped and flopped uh, throughout these issues. I think he's probably just saying that he was uh, jaining up uh, on his opponents. At one point, the beast is knocked clear across the street, straight past the car, within which sits Peter Parker. It's time for Peter to make excuses again, and one quick costume change later, he arrives just in time to stop the professor from finishing off the beast. During the ensuing battle, when the professor tells him his name, Spidey says, you're not Professor Power, you're his son, Matthew. And then the professor says, the father now lives within the son. Spidey says, doesn't the professor think that his son has suffered enough without now being put through this? But the professor says, what do you know of pain? The pain of a father who watches helplessly as his child, his heir, drifts forever into a mental vacuum. Who sees his dreams for his child's future destroyed and his only living family taken from him. Speaking of fathers and sons, Hank's dad is watching all this from behind the police cordon, and he's desperate to get through, saying, let me through, blast it, that's my boy out there. But in a hotel room high above the scene, his mother is preoccupied with the past, looking at pictures of the boy that Hank once was. She does hear the commotion outside, and looking out the window, she sees her son uh, embroiled in this battle. But as it says, if she feels anything at all, her face doesn't show it. The battle isn't going well. The tide is quickly turned against Spider-Man, who is taken out. The Beast, too, is hit by Professor Power's energy, and he lies unconscious on the floor. As it says, hope dies, Edna McCoy watches. Come on, Edna. Come on. Yes! 
The professor is about to crush Hank with some heavy equipment from the local construction site when his mum appears and intervenes. She pleads with him, saying, he's my son, my son. He's my flesh and blood. I gave him life. I don't know if you can understand what it means to be a parent, to have a child whose life is bound to yours forever. But if you can understand, please let him live. Hank's dad is still battling to get past the police cordon, but his wife's speech has done enough to make Professor Power hesitate. And in hesitating, that has given Spider-Man the opportunity to recover, snag him with a web line, and cause that big bit of machinery to fall on top of him. So Hank's mum came through and saved the day, and it's a very happy ending. As for Professor Power, well, he was far too powerful to be stopped by that construction equipment. He erupts from it and flies off, swearing he will return to have his revenge against Spider-Man and the X-Men. And he did indeed return to give both Spider-Man and the X-Men trouble in issues 197 to 199 of The Spectacular Spider-Man. Okay, we've got one more comic to look at today as we transition from the X-Men's Beast to the Defender's Gargoyle. Herb Trimpey finished his run on the title with the Professor X team up, and this issue represents the beginning of Kerry Gamble's run as penciler. Kerry is another one of those artists who worked for both of the big two, with most of his work for Marvel being contained within the pages of this title and Power Man and Iron Fist, and most of his work for DC revolving around Superman. Something struck me whilst reading this issue. The storyline follows on from an adventure in issue 109 of The Defenders. And it seems quite a few issues in this batch tie in to one degree or another to other Marvel comics. Issue 113 tied loosely into a couple of issues of Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man. Issue 114 had something of a follow-up in issue 271 of Captain America. Issues 115 and 116 alluded, albeit briefly, to an event in Thor issue 299 and the two-part Professor Power storyline not only called back to issues of the Micronauts, Defenders and Captain America, but it then got a follow-up in issue 124. This, all straight after issue 110, set up events that would be picked up several years later in Web of Spider-Man. For a series that was often seen as inconsequential, this is great, as it suggests that these stories do matter, that they are a part of the wider Marvel Universe. Anyway, Back to Spider-Man and Gargoyle. Issue 109 of The Defenders actually does a really good job uh, teeing up this issue. After battling the Enchantress and her evil minions, uh, Spider-Man and The Defenders are relaxing. There's a bit of casual chit-chat in which Spider-Man uh, refers to his team up with Cull the Conqueror in issue 112, further tying in Marvel team up uh, to the broader Marvel continuity before he then says, okay, uh, I'm going off, I'm gonna web around uh, for a bit, just to digest everything that we've all been through. The gargoyle says, actually, that sounds like a nice idea, can I join you? Of course, Spider-Man says yes. And then we are told to pick up Marvel Team Up issue 119 to see uh, how they spend their afternoon. Whilst we're on the subject of that issue of the Defenders, take a look at the corner box. How weird is that? Not right, is it, seeing Spidey's head there? Proof that he doesn't suit being in a team. Also, I never liked Gargoyle's image uh, on those corner boxes. Unfortunately, it gets reproduced here, even bigger than usual. The cover of this one says, who shall fall beneath the shadow of death? Now, normally you'd be thinking, okay, so maybe one of the main characters comes close to death, or maybe it features the Marvel character, uh, the embodiment of death uh, itself. Well, you'll find out. But what I will say is, this is written by J.M. Dematius, and he just can't help himself but inject the tale with a massive dose of humanity. So anyway, Spider-Man and Gargoyle are, are just chilling, hanging around in Central Park, that kind of thing, when Gargoyle tells Spider-Man uh, his origin story. And it's an interesting origin too. Gargoyle, real name Isaac Christians, uh, is, or was, a 78 year old human. 78? You don't get many uh, old superheroes, do you? Other than Steve Rogers, I suppose, but he doesn't count. 
He made a deal with a demon uh, to save a town from economic ruin, but surprise, surprise, uh, the demon tricked him, betrayed him, and he was trapped in this uh, grotesque body he now inhabits. Giving up all hope uh, of returning to a normal life, he tried to kill himself, but the spirits uh, of his parents and uh, late brother came to him and rekindled his fading spirit. That showed him that his life as the gargoyle uh, was kind of meant to be, and it was now his duty to use the powers that he'd been given to serve and to protect people from the very evils that had basically created him. Their conversation is interrupted by a scream for help, and they find an old woman in the process of being mugged. Of course, it doesn't take much for our heroes to deal with the muggers, but the old woman, their would-be victim, says something rather strange. She says, thank you, but you shouldn't have wasted your time helping me. At my age, my life really isn't worth saving. A now disguised gargoyle uh, is stung by this comment and he expostulates. He says, don't say that. He has an interesting take on it. He says, your life isn't worth less because you're old. If anything, it's worth more because you're old, because of the years that you have lived. He says, think of all that you've seen, all of the wisdom that you can share with others. Spider-Man then swings off and leaves them to it, as Gargoyle uh, offers to walk the old lady home. Back at her apartment, the discussion about life uh, continues. Gargoyle says she seems to be uh, a tough old girl, so he doesn't understand why she seems so defeated uh, in life. She says it's not about giving up, it's more that she feels she's had a full life, a rich life, and now it's time to, to move on, to have a rest. At that point, the old woman's daughter walks in uh, and screams that there's a monster in the apartment. But she's told, don't be silly, this isn't a monster, this is Isaac, and he's my friend. Meanwhile, there's big news at the Restwell nursing home as Aunt May tells Peter that Nathan, her fiance, has left her. It's okay, it's Marvel team up, it won't be permanent. May tells Peter that recently uh, Nathan learnt that a couple of his old colleagues uh, from his showbiz days uh, have passed away. This put him into a deep mood and then this morning she found a note from him saying that he loved her and that he was sorry but he couldn't go on living. Naturally Peter says he'll find him and as he sets out we see that Nathan is actually visiting one of his old theatres that he used to perform at. Time has moved on and the building is not just closed, but it's condemned. Nathan then turns around to find that his uh, carer, Jose, has gone, and in his stead are the gang of thugs from the park earlier. The old woman and her daughter are having an argument. Um, neither understands the other's point of view. They both feel like the other is treating them uh, as a child, and that they don't recognise that they know what is best. Gargoyle thinks he can help out and he asks them uh, if he can take them on a little trip. They agree, and Gargoyle takes flight, showing them that all around them in the city, there is life rushing headlong. An incredible river of joy, of terror, of great achievements and mundane pleasures. As both women, in their own way, understands, they connect. And soon, they are dropped back to the old woman's apartment. Things aren't getting much better for Nathan. The gang have now taken him inside the theatre to continue to terrorise him. But their fun doesn't last. Spidey, knowing Nathan's past, has headed over to the theatre district. And his spider sense now picks up on the trouble that the gang are causing. Not wishing to reveal himself, he deftly picks off the gang members one by one. There are only two of them left when Nathan begins to get lippy. They take exception to this and things begin to get really rough until who turns up? It had to be, didn't it? Aunt May. It turns out that when Jose was scared off, he ran back to the nursing home and told Aunt May uh, where Nathan was. Now, the two of them, feeling stronger, bolder in each other's company, try to fight back. But it is only so successful, and now they're really in trouble. Until, yeah, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie and it works a treat. This whole terrifying incident has shown two things. One, how great Aunt May is. And two, 
It's shown Nathan something that he already knew, but didn't realize he knew. And that is that he wants life, especially if that life is with Aunt May by his side. And Spider-Man, watching on from the shadows, thinks, I think they're gonna be just fine. Maybe that wasn't a cliche back in 1982. Then we are back in the company of the old woman and her daughter. The old woman, it seems, is taking her last breaths. And her daughter says, it doesn't seem right, it's not fair. But her mother says, of course it's fair. She looks back over the course of her life, the innocence of her youth, the warmth of a loving family, and the grief of the last goodbye. But she says, she sees now that this isn't a time for grief. This is the time for sharing a lifetime of love and moving on. The daughter thanks Gargoyle for helping her see uh, something of what her mother could see uh, in the world. But now she says she would like to spend some time uh, alone with her mother. Understanding and respecting her wishes, Gargoyle leaves. Outside he bumps into Spider-Man, but in stark contrast to their lengthy conversation at the beginning of the issue, this time they agree that all that both of them wants is to just sit for a while in silence. A great little tale and not a supervillain in sight. There is a supervillain in issue 120, a man by the name of Turner D. Century, a Z-list villain who would go on to meet his demise at the hands of that nemesis of Z-list villains everywhere, Scourge, in the pages of Captain America. Hmm, that's interesting. This batch of team-ups began with Devil Slayer and has ended with Dominic Fortune, two characters both of whom started life at Atlas Comics. No, 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 no. Not the 1950s Atlas of Martin Goodman and Stan Lee. No, the low-grade 1970s Atlas comics of Martin Goodman and Stan Lee's brother, Larry Lieber. Although they did go by different names. Devil Slayer was Demon Hunter, and Dominic Fortune was Morrow Frost, a.k.a. The Scorpion. That version of Atlas Comics has a very interesting and sorry history. Too in-depth for us to go into now. If you want to learn more about them, search Atlas Comics in YouTube and you'll find a great little potted history by the one and only Comic Tropes. I recommend it.